Hi, you're watching Stefan Levera Podcast, a show brought to you by swan.com. Today, we're talking about Mi Prima Bitcoin, aka my first Bitcoin. So a couple years ago, I had John from the team on and now he's rejoining me. The team has come so far. In fact, they have now taught this program to teach Bitcoin to students, over 25,000 students uh, in that time since and it is now going international. So I thought it'd be a good time to get John back on and hear some updates from him on how far they have come. So now on to my chat with John. Okay, John, welcome back to the show. Hey, thank you. Thank you for having me. So let's talk a little bit about what you guys are doing um, it's been a while since we last spoke on the show, um, but uh, and I've seen you around uh, at a few different events here and there. Um, it'd be good to you know just get a bit of an overview. What's what's the latest with uh, me, Primo Bitcoin? Yeah, there are so many different things that I could say to to answer that question. So I'll try to I'll try to keep it short and give a give an overview. Um, so a couple of things that I'm excited about, like right now today is the newest version of the Bitcoin Diploma. So that's the 2024 version. That will come out in about a week. So last days of March, first days of April. Um, and that's a big improvement over every every year. We try to iterate upon it and we try to take feedback in and make it a little bit better. So we're really excited about this one. But it's not just the content that has changed. We've also redesigned the infrastructure around it. So it's always been open source. But now we've, you know, just we've created an infrastructure and that means file formats, that means telegram groups, that means like documents that share best practices about translations, all of these things to facilitate the spread of that to other communities around the world. So currently there are, so it had been translated, the last version had been translated into 10 or 11 languages, I believe, which is amazing. And we're super happy with that. This new one, so the so the uh the last part was the design part so the the content was was done about a month ago and we've already sent it out to to some people to to begin on the translations and there are 25 groups of people working on translating it into their local language currently right so that should come out like pretty soon after we release it in english and spanish in in a couple of weeks um and that's a big part of that is just the infrastructure that we've developed around it right to make it easier uh so that's one thing the bitcoin diploma in conjunction with that or aided by by the bitcoin diploma is is we have a international network of nodes of bitcoin educators around the world that share a similar ethos and philosophy um and share best practices so so that that philosophy so we we try to borrow from from bitcoin itself as much as possible right so that's why we call it the node network and all that and and we consider me from our Bitcoin El Salvador, the quote unquote Genesis block. Uh, so we <laughs> we created these consensus rules, and in order to join the network, you have to agree to the consensus rules, and there's six of them, and that's that the education must be independent, impartial, community led, Bitcoin only, quality, and teach empowerment. So long as you do that and you're active, like you you could demonstrate proof of work. Then you could be in the 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 network is actually self governing at this point, so it's not up to us. It's it's up to all the nodes that are in whether new people are allowed to join or not, and they're actually pretty strict. So right now there are twenty seven nodes in twenty one countries. Um, it's been active for a little bit more than a year now, but we're kind of coming out of stealth mode more recently. And the most the most recent round, uh, there were four applicants that you know submit their proof of work essentially like yes i agree to to these consensus rules here's my proof of work i'd like to join um and that was from spain nepal tanzania and mexico and the network actually rejected three of them right that they they have pretty high standards which i think is great um and only the one that was accepted was mexico which is in isla de las mujeres which is a really amazing project um and i love like they uh, the woman who runs it, her name is Isabella, and she is great at what I'll call working in the open, right? She started like a fundraising for it. And like, as soon as she got enough money, she went out to the store, bought a bunch of materials and like made a video about it. Like, hey, this is what happened with the donation. So she's she's really good at, at working in public. Uh, right. I know that okay. was a so, yeah, I mean, so yeah, I guess yeah. Yeah, you mentioned a lot of different <laughs> locations. I think 
that's probably the big thing. Probably for a lot of people who might have only heard my first episode with you, they might have thought it's just in El Salvador. But I guess that's probably the main thing now that it's you know it's it's going out uh, to many different nations. Um, and so, do you want to just I guess refresh people on the format here because it's like a curriculum in terms of teaching somebody about Bitcoin. Is it designed to be taught in person, or what's the you know what's the format here? Yeah, yeah, great question. Um... Yes. So it was designed to be taught in person. So the first use case that we had for it was to teach it in person in the public school system here in El Salvador, which is something we continue to do. It uh, One of the other changes with the version this year, with the infrastructure changes, the formatting changes, it's easier for communities to remove a paragraph, a page, whatever, and replace it with something that is more relevant to their local context. And that would include, we're also working on this year, creating a better online version. So there are some people that already teach it online, but it's not designed for that. It's designed to be in person. Uh, So we are working this year, we'll come out with an online first version of it. I see. Yeah. And so just to give people some context, what is the normal time frame to go from start to finish of this course is it like a few weeks or is it you know what, what's the normal time frame there so when we teach it and kind of what we recommend is 10 weeks so there are 10 classes each class is it's about an hour and a half long so you could say it's 15 hours right and you could break that up differently you could you could do it in in five weeks if you do it twice a week you could you could space it out longer if you want uh but but there are 10 classes an hour and a half each and it's basically zero to bitcoin right so this is targeted at no coiners free coiners people that are curious about bitcoin or maybe they're they're maybe it's a course that they have to take up to high school here in el salvador but they start with a base level of knowledge that is next to zero so the first part of the the book is financial literacy essentially right it's like what is money why is money how did we arrive at this moment in time um, and then the second part, so that's the first four chapters. So it's, so it's nearly half and half. Uh, so the second half goes into, goes into Bitcoin. We don't talk about Bitcoin at all in the first four weeks of the course. It's just laying the groundwork for, you know, why we need Bitcoin, right? Um, one of the, one of my favorite things about the, the workbook is the very first day, the very first page, the teacher asks the students why Bitcoin. And there's a couple of pages that they could fill out the very last day, the very last activity. Same question, a couple of blank pages. And what we've seen is that first page is almost blank, right? Like people might write a paragraph or something. And by the last day, those last pages, sometimes they staple extra pages on, right? Like three pages isn't enough to explain why Bitcoin. Um, Interesting. Yeah. So yeah, it shows uh, how much uh, people are learning. That's cool. And I think the other important point is it's not just like a university level course, right? These are school kids who are learning this course uh, and who were some of the first people taught this course in El Salvador. I was having a look on the website. It looks like you've, you're listing there. You've taught over 25,000 students in person um, that, that have gone through this course. So can yes. you just elaborate a bit on that point? Or maybe that number's changed since now. Maybe that number's out of date. Yeah, that number's higher. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that number is higher. And the number actually gets harder to to track as as we grow right just because there are uh, so i guess there's two numbers numbers that we directly teach and numbers that um for example we are working with the ministry of education uh and we are actually teaching so they took the bitcoin diploma which is which is open source um and that's kind of their their primary source document and they've made a couple of edits and modifications to fit their needs um but we are helping to train public school teachers that will teach it on behalf of the Ministry of Education. So, so far, this is something that we're doing alongside Bitcoin Beach. Last year, the pilot started. We taught 150 public school teachers. Um, starting next month, the, the next cohort is going to be 550 public school teachers, so 700 total. Uh, and we actually are teaching them our Bitcoin diploma to give them that base knowledge right before they go into the school system and they teach a slightly modified version that the Ministry of Education has has created. Um, So it's like, do we count all 700? I don't know. 
because it's kind of a crash course too. We don't do it over 10 weeks. We do it over like a week. It's a, it's a crash course that we do with them. But yeah, so the Bitcoin diploma, sorry to get back to your original question in such a roundabout way, but yeah, we've probably taught uh, 30 to 35,000 in person here in El Salvador. We teach it in the in the public school system. So that's 14, 15, 16, 17 year olds. But we also have open enrollment courses. So we have a we have a house slash office slash school, like a multi-purpose space that we have here in the capital. Uh, we work out of community centers and municipal buildings around the country, and we have open enrollment, right? So anybody that wants to could take the course and there's no age restriction there. And what we've seen is it was made for teenagers, but, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60, we've, we've had students in their eighties, uh, and, and it's, it's, it's basically 13 and up, I would say, right? Because the teenagers don't have to unlearn as much. Whereas the adults, even though you would think that maybe something that's for a 14 year old would be too remedial for an adult, it's, it's actually not like it's, it's kind of the same range. So, yeah, interesting. I think it's fair to say that uh, over time, um, we've had like the average reading age has been coming down over time, sadly, right? It's almost that like, you know, it, it's sort of for that reason, it's like you, you need to make sure it's very simple and it's just, it's just accessible to everybody, right? We want Bitcoin to be accessible to everybody. Um, so that's probably just an important thing to remember. Um, but I'm sure at the same time, there are probably kids younger than 13 who've done the course also, right? So it's not... Uh, yeah, uh, it's not like you have to be thirteen to be able to do the course. Um, I I also would be curious in terms of how has it gone trying to localize the course for different countries, different languages. Are there actually differences in how it's taught? Yeah, yeah, there are differences in how it's taught, and I think that's one of the benefits of of the Node Network, right? So, like, we share best practices. So, for example, we. We teach a, a certain way. We, as I said, we do, we do it once a week for ten weeks. Other people have experimented crunching it into a two-week course, right? Doing like every day, Monday through Friday, for two straight weeks, right? To get those, to get those ten days, or to do uh, class one and to, to do two classes at a time to to make it like a longer session and do two two classes at a time. Um, there have been people we're kind of in the early stages of experimenting with uh how we offer the course so we generally do it for free we're starting to experiment with this as well but like one idea that people are are experimenting with is to ask for a payment in in dollars at the start of the course say like thirty dollars right and then when they when they graduate if they go to all the classes and they finish then they get thirty dollars in Bitcoin at the end. So something like that, you know, just so it's too easy to sign up to a free class and then not come, right? Uh, so to avoid that, so it's it's there are people that are teaching it different, and and another thing would be stable coins. So stable coins are not relevant here in El Salvador because it's dollarized. But in a place like Argentina, then where stable coins are are part of the conversation, so we don't talk about stable coins in in the in the book that we produce because it's not relevant like there's no there's no reason to in this local context uh but other people have found it useful to to talk about it depending on their local context so so there's things like that like uh, and that's besides changing examples so for example in in Kenya i know that they that they talk about mpesa right which isn't relevant in other places so that's that's kind of contextual there so for the most part it's the same but but it's interesting to see how people are tweaking it in different ways. And then the idea is with enough time that that is all shared with the whole network. And it's like, hey, you know, this it worked really well to charge up front and give them the money back at the end. And maybe other people start to do that. Or uh, There's a lot of experimentation. And we're kind of at the early stages of, of seeing, you know, if, if that could be applied in other places. We're kind of still in the experimentation phase. Yeah. And so I presume then it's like you have a base curriculum and each, you know, as you said, there's a new one coming out for this year. That just means each year, each different location has to then localize, right? They have to kind of look at, okay, what's changed from this year to last year and update on their side. Okay. This is kind of our new, this is what we're going with now. 
uh, and this is the new localization we have to do or the new language, the new translations that we have to do to kind of keep it up to date. Yeah, and we try to we try to make it what I'll call like a soft fork, right, rather than a hard fork. So from one version to the next, there's if you're familiar with if you've taught the 2023 version, then it shouldn't be that big of a a learning curve to to teach the 2024 version. Um, so a lot of the upgrades that we made actually aren't necessarily with the content. It's just like the infrastructure around it making it easier for people. Um, and there's, you know, but there's always, there's always room for improvement, right? Like we could always do better. Um, that's the idea of perfection. Perfection, perfection doesn't exist, but it's important that we always trend in the right direction towards improving this every year. Gotcha. Um, and as part of the course material, do you end up referring out to other things where people would learn more, like go and read this book or whatever other materials out there or is it sort of seen like okay this course should just be like it should just be enough to sort of get you started and that's it yeah so so, so i want to say yes to both those options um yes we do have at the end like further reading right and it just lists a bunch of book, right. books and throughout the book there's you know within each chapter there's qr codes that lead to further reading lists where people could dive deeper if they want to. Um, I think that Bitcoin is the best teacher and the the hardest thing to do is is to get off of zero, right? So that's, that's what we're focused on, getting people off of zero. And then I think people are capable of, of continuing on their own. One of the, one of the most important things that we try to teach to our students isn't necessarily Bitcoin education but it is the ability to think for yourself, the ability to like have agency in your own intellectual journey. Um, so that said, this is something, there are courses like here in El Salvador, there's Google Plus, which is, which is uh, more advanced, more technical. Um, so we kind of see ourselves as the top of funnel and it could go down to more advanced classes afterwards. Uh, we're, this year we're working on creating a number of other courses that are a bit more specific, not not this general, just from zero to one with Bitcoin, but um, you know about mining, about for targeting younger audiences. Um, again, the online version, just just a variety of different branches off of that. Uh, I think this will always be our main. This will be the trunk of everything that we do. Is that zero to one? Uh, we'll develop some stuff some branches off of that and we'll also refer people to uh, other great programs that that can take people from from one to infinity right there because there's <laughs> back to the show in a moment coinkite.com is the leading provider of bitcoin security hardware i use their devices regularly and notably they've got the cold card and other devices such as the tap signer which you can use there and of course they've got the new q device i've got those in the mail I'm looking forward to uh, using these, the, using the new Q device, but really with Bitcoin security, it's important to use hardware devices to keep our keys offline. So instead of keeping them on online connected devices, you've got to keep them offline and use specialized uh, devices to interact and sign those Bitcoin transactions, which is what you do when you are sending Bitcoin. And so the cold card has so many features. It has multiple secure elements. You can use it in all kinds of configurations, whether that's single signature or multi-signature if you're advanced, or maybe if you want to use it with a passphrase, there's all kinds of features there. I like using the cold card and I use it as part of multiple setups that I have, some in multi-signature and so on. So if you want to get your devices, go to CoinKite dot com and order your cold cards with the code Levera for a discount there. The lead sponsor of this show is Swan Bitcoin. Over at swan.com, you can buy Bitcoin and you can learn about Bitcoin. You can use ACH or wire transfer to send your dirty fiat into Swan and then you can either do a smash buy and purchase a lump sum or set up an ongoing recurring purchase plan. So this is a great way to regularly accumulate sats and not really worry so much about the volatility whether the price is up down left right who cares just regularly accumulate and of course with swan we want you to withdraw your coins into your own self-custody free 
automated withdrawals. So make sure you use that feature to withdraw the sats into your own self-custody once you've hit the, the thresholds that make sense for you to do that. And with Swan, remember, the team is trying to create millions of intransigent Bitcoiners. And this is the way to win the race before we have to fight the war. So if you want to sign up and learn about Bitcoin, go to swan.com and you can find out more over there. There's a range of different services, whether you're a retail individual, a high net worth, a corporate, a business, you can find more over at swan.com. And finally, mempool.space. Mempool.space is the leading Bitcoin and blockchain visualizer. I use it all the time to see what's going on in the mempool. I like to see what are the fees that I would need to send a transaction at if I wanted to get into the next block. And over at mempool.space, the team are continually innovating. They're always adding new ways that you can visualize things and understand what's going on, whether that's the mempool goggles, whether that is the different tabs that you can look at, for example, the mining tab, the lightning tab. They even have a liquid explorer also. And don't forget, you can search Bitcoin transactions, whether that, you know, such as historical transactions. Or, of course, you can see what's in the mempool uh, or in mempools uh, currently. So to find out more, go to mempool.space and they have an accelerated program which you can sign up for at mempool.space slash accelerator. And now back to my chat with John. Yeah, of course. And I mean, in fairness, this is, as you said, this is a 15 hour, this is 15 hours worth of material designed for a 13 year old person. That's very different from, you know, the kind of thing where, I mean, there are, there already are university level Bitcoin courses. There's already, you know, serious developer level courses and right. everything. I mean, there's all kinds of free material online, but you know, it's important to understand the context of what this is, who is it for? And then after that, you know, people can go and learn further. I mean, there are people out there who've spent hundreds of hours or thousands of hours learning about Bitcoin and probably many, you know, people like listeners of this show probably have spent thousands of hours, right? So yeah. for them, it's kind of not that, uh, you know, but it's just sort of important to understand the context there. You've also mentioned, um, and I know you were running some events related to Me Primo Bitcoin as well. So do you want to just touch on that as well? What, what are you, what are you uh, hoping to achieve with, with those events and what, what are these events you're running? Yeah, yeah. So we have what we call independent Bitcoin education on conferences, right? Maybe a better way to say that for a Bitcoin audience would be a decentralized conference. So we did the first one in El Salvador in November of last year, 2023. We did the second one, the first international one in Madeira in Portugal, February 29th of this year. Um, the next one will be in Nashville uh, in July. And what that is, is it's it's a pretty small conference. So it's it's we sell 150 tickets and it's basically so with the node network, we have monthly. We have a monthly general assembly, right? So like there's all these channels, communication channels, telegram groups, whatever, where people could share best practices, talk to each other anytime. But once a month, then we all get together and do it in a bit more reformal setting. Um, but it's online, right? Which is great. It's great to connect people around the world online, but it's like, huh, would this be better if we could if we could organize something in person where we could get Bitcoin educators from around the world to basically share best practices and speed up the timeline, support each other? Um, so that that's kind of the the genesis of the idea. And to really go further into Bitcoin again, Bitcoin is our teacher. So decentralization is one of our focuses. It's it's kind of a hybrid where we do plan part of the day so it's a full day event right it's like seven eight hours right morning to, to evening um lunch break in the middle uh, it's basically a one-day conference and we organize a space where it's traditional format it's somebody at the front of a room there's all chairs facing the same direction it's multi it, it's mostly from the stage to the audience right it's like it, it, the the information flows in one direction um what we also do is at the start of the day, people who haven't been selected for that stage, right? Because people just apply if they're going, if, if they have something to present, uh, then they could give a very quick, like one minute audio introduction, who they are, what they want to talk about. And we have someone, his name is James, who has a lot of experience with this. And he he writes it all down on a big piece of paper in front of everyone. And, and based on, you know, what the topics that come in and like, uh, how they relate to each other. He might combine some. He might um, say like, okay, that's not really relevant, whatever. But 
But with the participation of everyone there, then he'll make, will collectively make the agenda for a second and third space. And the second and third space are more like roundtable sort of format, right? So it's like there is one or two or three or four discussion leads that are going to talk about the topic, say it's the role of Bitcoin education within circular economies. And it will be a couple of people that are involved with different circular economies, right? So they'll lead the discussion, but it will be, it will be a discussion rather than a, um, than a speech. So that's the second and third space are decided day of. And really the big, the big value is, is the in between, right? The, the, as the day goes on, right. then it's usually People like connect and share notes, that kind of thing, compare notes on how they're teaching. Yeah. And that's why I think 150 is a really good number for that because it's big enough that there's a lot of diversity there, but it's small enough that it's like, Oh, I, that guy said something really interesting in the morning. Let me try to catch up with him. And like, it's, pretty easy to catch up with that person later right um so by the end of the day there's usually like a fourth and a fifth space where it's just like groups of people that are continuing conversations that were a bit more organized that started earlier in the day great okay um let's talk a little bit about um your collaboration process with governments and universities um yeah. do you want to just talk a little bit about how that goes and you know what are the typical requests that they have of you and what is it like for you to work with them yeah. So a question that is always front of mind for us is how do we best stay independent and impartial, which is could be a challenge sometimes, right? Uh, especially with, with these large entities. Um, so I'll give an example of, I'll give an example and, 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 and also just talk about uh, a new thing that we're doing. So we, we are, in the very, very early stages, but it's already been announced publicly, uh, working with the Ministry of Education, as well as um, not be able to pronounce her last name, but Lena from The Little Hodler. So uh, along with, with her, ourselves and the Ministry of Education, we are working or we are going to work on creating new curriculum for younger audiences for the public school system here. Right. So two, two Bitcoin education courses that will precede the Bitcoin diploma, right? For seven, eight, nine and 10, 11, 12. And the Bitcoin diploma starts at 13 then. And the way that we went into that was in order to remain independent and partial, we decided or we have never taken any funding from, from, from a government here or, or elsewhere. Uh, so what we asked for was we wanted we wanted it to be open source like whatever we work on and create if it's open source so that we could share it with other educators around the world um so that was i i think it might be the first curriculum developed by a ministry of education that will be open source uh, I, i'm not sure about that i've never heard of it before um but so that's kind of our approach right like we don't want to get the traditional thing out of it the traditional thing might be money uh, what we want to get out of it is is experience and we want to be able to use it freely for other purposes and give it away to other people that will be able to use it. And then in turn, that that will hopefully help our own fundraising. Right. Like it's like, oh, that's really cool what they did. OK, I'm going to I'm going to give a few sats here. Right. So it's kind of a different model, but it's a way that we think we're better able to stay independent and impartial. I say, yeah, so. I guess it's you're saying not taking government funding, but individual donations and maybe company donations. Are, yeah, you know, and, okay. and grants are a new one that um, it is a doesn't take up a big percent of our of our income at the moment is grants, but I think going forward it will that that percent will grow. Um, and and you know it, it makes it easier to apply to grants if if we're like hey look this is this is how we approach things rather than hey we got a bunch of money to do this working with the government could we also get money from you like that's a harder ask i see yeah yeah okay great um and i guess yeah maybe it sort of comes back to as well like localization aspects right like if government or you know you well actually that's the other aspect so we talk about governments have you had universities and schools reach out in terms of 
collaboration with them on their courses and their material or is it more like they're coming out to you and just saying hey we'd like to use your material both but more the more the latter i i think like a lot of what we do is we try to make it easier for people to say yes right like easier for uh university or government whatever to to start to teach bitcoin education because it's like hey we'll we'll get it started we'll do some of the heavy lifting and just give it to you basically um so that happens a lot there there's also people that reach out to us that are like hey we want to build something can you help us build it right so there's a university a university in Colombia it's one of the larger universities i think it's i think it's a network there's a i want to say uh, i don't know the exact number but there it's a network of universities in Colombia i think it's like the public university system there um they already had in mind to build a course and then they saw what we had and they were like huh can this can you guys work with us to to fit this into something an idea that we already had right so it wouldn't be the entire course it would be a part of it rather than cuz this is this will take a semester right so it's more than 15 hours so it's like can you can you guys be in charge of of working this into uh, say a 50 hour course and and put your 15 hours in there um so that's something that we're working on with with the with some universities in Colombia now and i think a lot of what we do is is try to create that first model right so that's effectively what we're doing with this university in Colombia and then you know we'll we'll learn some some lessons there and it will be easier the next time and and once once that actually starts then we'll be able to kind of pitch it right like this is what we did with this university in Colombia hey university in Bolivia would you like to do something similar it's it's much easier once there's an example to point to yeah and i can imagine the content might be it might really need a rework right because if it's if it's targeted for 13 year olds now if we're talking about 20 year olds at university they they'll need a different thing um but that said yeah. there's also a lot of existing material i know even um some of the work i did for the sailor for sailor academy some of that is actually being used as well by some different universities and uh, companies also where they just kind of took that material and used it and I don't even know they're using it right like it's just <laughs> out there um, so good on them um, but that's cool so if we had to summarize where things are going for this year as you said you're updating the curriculum and I guess maybe it sounds to me from what you're saying that uh, the focus now is sort of getting it out there to other countries so that other countries can pick up this material pick up the gauntlet and run with it is that the main focus for this year with 2024 yeah, yeah. So we we have a uh, you know our vision statement is three simple steps to change the world. And step one is to make El Salvador an example. Basically, is to prove that uh, Bitcoin education could be a tool for empowerment at mass scale. And step two is to make that example easy to spread and replicate around the world. And so we're we're kind of you know there's there's a lot more work here in El Salvador. I'm not I'm not trying to say like okay, <laughs> mission accomplished. Yeah, we're right? done here. But, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. But but there's a path now, right? Yeah. There's like a path now that we could start to apply some lessons learned, some best practices from El Salvador to everywhere, right? To to speed up the timeline for the next El Salvador. I mean, El Salvador is a bit special. I don't know, um, but the next country the the second the third the fourth the fifth um yeah the 21st right uh so yeah that that is a big focus is is international me Premier bitcoin will increasingly become international we'd like to say el salvador el salvador is the focus the mission is the world we've always been we've always seen el salvador as a really high leverage opportunity to do something that will echo, right? And we're kind of in that echo part of things now. Yeah, interesting. One other area um, I want to touch on, you mentioned this idea of you know education for the masses, right? Now, I guess this is going to be a bit more hairy because at the same time, like in terms of you know, what happens when, you know, not everybody can, you know, go on chain, you know, like can afford to do that. Like what, what's the kind of approach going to be there? Because at the same time, it's like you, we want to, you know, you, as you mentioned, one of the values is to empower and so on. But at the same time, there's going to be a lot of people who simply cannot afford to use like, you know, self-custodial 
stuff. So what's going to be the, you know, uh, the approach around that? Is it just going to be that, you know, you have to use some kind of service provider until you're able to be self-custodial? Um, but is that, is that just going to be more like a, or do you just sort of push that off and say, look, let's cross that, cross that bridge when we come to it, you know, because maybe we're not there yet. Yeah, I mean, we're mostly pushing that off. But to give an example of how we've we've dealt with it in the past, like a similar thing. Uh, so the very first, so we, we've been doing the Bitcoin diploma since 2022. So it's crazy. It's it's less than two years because it was later in the year. Um, and there's already been so, so many evolutions. So in 2022, the first, what we do at the end is, is we do a verification of the students. It's their final exam, right? But it's, just our own spin on it and one of the activities that we did in those first classes was they had to the students had to recover a wallet from seed like make a wallet uh destroy it recover it from seed and send a transaction but that was on chain so then the fees went up and that became right like it's like laughable well, right yeah it's just not yeah, feasible <laughs> that's we we can't i mean it was just to demonstrate it wasn't it's not a real transaction like it doesn't have any real value to it um so we had to modify that and uh they they still restore the wallet and it's but different students are restoring the same wallet right so the wallet has a balance so we know that they've successfully yeah. restored it um but rather than everyone restore in their own wallet now multiple people are restoring one wallet right so that's right just... just for testing and demonstration purposes and i know even um there's a actually i'm reminded now i know there was a wallet project called padawan and the idea is it's like a test net bitcoin wallet and it's there to kind mm. of teach people so that's maybe like another example that uh you know this and and you're i mean this is right this is the way it's going to have to evolve over time right like maybe in the early days yeah you can't just do everything on chain because it's cheap and whatever but as fees rise then it's going to start to really, uh, th- those fees are going to start to bite and uh, you'll we'll right. have to have other approaches to educate people and to show them, okay, this is how you recover and this is how you use it. Um, so, yeah, but yeah, so be yeah, it, I right? Mean, it I could, mean, that's, that's, uh, it could be far that's into the reality the of Bitcoin. Yeah, that, that, you know, these students never do anything on chain, but I think it's still important that they understand that that first layer right so it's like how can we help them understand it even if they might not ever use it and maybe like what you uh, i'm not familiar with that one but 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 a way to use it without (laughs) without those fees but a way to understand it because one of the things that that we've learned is uh, bitcoin education should be interactive right like it yeah people want it to be tangible that that's one of the the barriers that a lot of new people have is like, but I can't hold it in my hands. I can't, it's not real because it, it, I, it's not physical. So it's not real. Um, so as much as possible, we, we try to, uh, let them use it. Right. And then they use right. it. It's the on their phone. Part, they send it. Yeah, it's more and they're realistic. like, Oh, yeah. it, it makes it real to them. They're like, Oh, I, I, I can't, it, I can't see it. I, I actually am holding it in my hand because it's on my phone and my phone's in my hand. Um, so that's important right. that to always to always use, but there might have to be things like on testnet, basically, for on-chain. And then whether it's Lightning or other layer twos that come in the future, that might be something that they actually use. And we teach them the theory about layer one, but they only use it on testnet, something like that. Yeah, that that may just be the way it goes because it, you you just have to keep uh, updating uh, based on what's practical and what's pragmatic. Uh, and I think that's something that a lot of education over time has it falls out of date. And so that's that's the other important part of actually keeping the material up to date as as you are doing, as you mentioned. So um, that's an interesting focus. I think those are some of the key questions I, I kind of had. If there's any, I guess, uh, closing thoughts for listeners and, you know, if you, if you want to call out for help, if there's anything that you would like uh, listeners to know, uh, what would you like listeners to take away? Yeah, um, I think the takeaway is something that, that we try to do is, is, again, always focus on empowerment. And part of that is, to make it easier for people to get started, but also somebody that wants to, to, 
to educate about Bitcoin and they don't need us. They don't need anyone else. They could do it on their own. Like one of the messages that we want to send people is like, we are capable, right? We're all capable of, of being more than, than, uh, than what we're often told in this world, right? Like, I think that's one of the shifts from fiat to Bitcoin is that we are in control of our own lives and that changes everything that the second and third order effects of that means that it we're incentivized to plan to build to create um and we don't need permission to get started so take control of your own life take control of your own future uh we think that bitcoin education is a great tool to do that and we want to as much as possible help people get started on that journey um and, and then we always need help right this is a big mission we want to change the world with bitcoin education and we can't do it alone. That's that's a huge mission. So the way that people could get involved is, I mean, the, the simplest thing is they could just donate sats. Uh, so we have a on our web page, which is mepremerebitcoin.io or myfirstbitcoin.io. They could donate it directly there. We also have a campaign on Geyser Fund, um, which is a great way to support uh, Bitcoin projects. Um, so find us on there and donate. Another way is we're always looking for expertise right if you could translate into your local language if you're really great at uh marketing if you're really great at at like uh you know technical aspects and you could make our github better if you're whatever you're great at if you could contribute that skill so we need your sats we need your time we need your energy um but you don't need us right uh, like if you want the world to be better then make it so well that's great so uh yeah listeners make sure you check it out i'll put the links in the show notes it's me prima bitcoin.io uh and uh john uh great work with what you're doing out there and uh you know best of luck with it i'll see you soon thanks thank you so much right. lastly if you enjoyed the show make sure you thumbs up and uh give it a review share it out there with family and friends and i'll see you in the citadels <laughs>